we come now again to Revelation chapter 19. And as we look at this passage, it is one of the most glorious chapters, I believe, in the entire Bible. And what we're going to look at today could be the culmination of all of human history. An author by the name of Paul Bellheimer once said that romance is at the heart of the universe. That everything that God has been doing throughout history is for one purpose. And that is to select and purchase and prepare a bride for the Son, Jesus Christ. And now we see in the book of Revelation, all of heaven, chapter 19, all of heaven is bursting forth into praise and, and uh, thunderous sounds of worship and praise. And they're saying, Alleluia, Alleluia, for the Lord our God has entered His reign. They are also praising God that He has brought judgment upon that prostitute who is riding on the scarlet beast. That the systems of this world that are anti-God and anti-Christ and anti-church are being judged and torn down by God. God is going to return this earth to its rightful owner. We will reign and rule with Christ. Jesus Christ will be the one who owns and reigns and rules over this entire earth. And we will reign and rule with Him. Not just over the earth, but over all of God's creation. What a marvelous, mind-boggling thought that is. But let's read our text, Revelation chapter 19. And after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia, for, sm for her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as a sound of many waters, as a sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Then he said to me, Right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So now we come to the third reason why this uh, universal or uh, heavenly praise is bursting out. Alleluia! Praise the Lord! Praise our God! Well, the first reason was true and righteous are his judgments. He has judged that harlot that sat upon the, the scarlet beast. The second reason was the Lord our God, omnipotent, the controller of the whole, has now entered into his reign. But now we see a third reason for this heavenly outburst of worship. For the, the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made himself herself ready. This is the culmination of all of human history. And, and what, what human history has been all about is God selecting and preparing a bride for His Son. Now we have seen there are two women. One was the harlot in Revelation chapter 17, and now we see the bride of Christ. And so they stand as exact opposites. We have seen two cities, Babylon, the city that man built, and we will see the New Jerusalem, the city that God builds. We will also see two great suppers. Here we see the marriage supper of the Lamb. But at the end of this chapter, we will see a supper of judgment. And so there are these images that stand in contrast one to the other. Well, let's look at this phrase. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and the phrase, and His bride has made herself ready. Well, if you go throughout the scripture, you'll see a lot about marriage. The whole plan of redemption is patterned on an ancient form of marriage where there would be a search for the bride, uh, then that uh, bride had to be purchased, and the price had to be agreed upon, and when the two families agreed upon that purchase price and the marriage itself, they would have a meal together, and then the price would have to be paid, 
and then the marriage supper could occur. Now also there was an engagement period where the, the man would go back to his home and build a home for his bride-to-be. This was called a betrothal. We see this is what Joseph was involved with with Mary. He was legally married to her, but they weren't together. It was during this betrothal period. Well, the whole analogy is this. Jesus has prepared a place for us. And one day he will come back to receive us, just like the groom coming back in the night a lot of times to receive his wife unto himself. And then they would have a great marriage feast after the groom came for the bride. There would be a shout, come forth. And the bride and her wedding party will have readied themselves and they'll go back to the marriage supper. Sometimes the supper could last as long as seven days. And then after that supper, they would come together as man and wife and begin their family life for the rest of their life. Well, this is the same analogy that all of redemption hangs on. And Jesus Christ is coming back for His bride. So the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. That time of the marriage feast has now arrived at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how does the bride make herself ready? Notice the praise is for a couple of things. Uh, be glad and rejoice, give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. See, right now the church is only engaged to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11. Now that is a legally binding part of marriage in ancient times. But we are engaged as spouse to Jesus. But our marriage supper has not yet occurred. So everything that God has been doing in history is to call a bride and to prepare a bride. And there are a couple of things that the book of Revelation makes very clear. Must be a part of the bride's preparation. The purpose of these lessons is not just to gain intellectual knowledge of the future, but to how to overcome now in the present and how to apply these truths of the book of Revelation to our present everyday life. Well, here's the first way the bride has made herself ready. In verse 8 it says, And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, these white garments speak of righteousness. It comes around and says that. It is the righteousness or even the righteous acts as some translations are, but the righteousness of the saints. How does the bride get herself ready? By living a righteous life, by entering into the righteousness of God. We see in Revelation 21 too, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Now that adorning for her husband is the white garments of righteousness. So what is the church to be all about in terms of preparation for the coming of the Lord and our marriage for all eternity with Him, the marriage supper of the Lamb that will inaugurate that marriage? Our preparation is to be living righteous lives. Now, righteousness and this whole idea of white and righteousness, Revelation 3, 4, and 5, oh, uh, the overcomers will be dressed in white. In Revelation 7, 14, that sealed company that was coming out of great tribulation, they washed their robes and made white by the blood of the Lamb. And they had kept themselves pure. Revelation 14, 4 through 5. Blessed are those whose robes are made right. They have white robes, and that is second, uh, uh, second 22, Revelation 22, rather, verse 14. Now, in the Bible, the theology of righteousness goes something like this. There is both imputed righteousness, that is righteousness that is credited to our account, and then there is actualized righteousness, that is yielding to the work of the Word and the work of the Spirit in our lives, that we might actually become righteous. And Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will in no wise enter the kingdom of God. And so it must be a God thing. It must be the Spirit of God working in our lives to produce, to actualize the righteousness that He has credited us with. Now, Im imputed is, or imputation is a banking term. It means to credit something to someone's account. 
And when you became a believer in Jesus Christ, His righteousness was credited to your account. Therefore, God can now treat you as if you are innocent, as if you are declared innocent, as if you are righteous. That is the doctrine of imputed righteousness. Now notice what it says. It says, and to her it was granted to be arrayed. You know, something was given to her. A right, a privilege was given to her. It was granted unto her to be arrayed in white. This is symbolic of imputed righteousness. It's given to us. But notice it also says, the bride has made herself ready. So she did something to participate in this process. And I believe that, thinks, that, that speaks of actualized righteousness. So let's ask ourselves the very important question. Are we becoming ready for the marriage supper? Are we getting our righteousness uh, together as our righteous garments of white? Are we wearing them? Are we living carnal lives and sinful lives? If Jesus Christ were to come today, would you be ashamed as it warns us of in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 through 3, 3? Or would you know that you've been living a righteous life because He imputed to you His righteousness and then by His grace and His Spirit and His Word, He actualizes that righteousness in us. Ephesians 5 talks about the bride uh, being purified and the, the, the wife being beautified and purified, being washed by the Word. And that's why it's so important that you are in a church that believes the Word of God, teaches, preaches the Word of God, that you on a daily basis are feeding yourself the Word of God so that you can have that cleansing and your garments can be white. Alleluia, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. Oh, have your garments ready that you might enter into that marriage supper and then enjoy your marriage with Jesus Christ for all eternity. Righteousness is important for the church. And part of the reason we go through things is for God to produce that actualized righteousness in us. Now, the book of Revelation tells us something else the bride's going to be doing. And that is we will be reigning and ruling with Him for all eternity. The Bible says in Romans 8, 17, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We are co-sovereigns with Him, as it were. 2 Timothy 2, 11, Revelation 3, 21, even as He overcame and was granted to sit down on His Father's throne, those that overcome will be granted to sit down with Him on His throne. Those that overcome will inherit all things, Revelation 21, 7. And we are to reign and rule. We see it later on, we're going to have another lesson on the picture of Jesus coming as a mighty warrior and he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. But we've already seen in the book of Revelation 2, 26 through 29, that those who overcome will rule the nations with a rod of iron. So our future is to be the bride of Christ that marriage consummated after the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we are to be getting ourselves ready by living righteous lives now, but also learning something about rulership. Where do we learn about rulership? Where do we learn how to exercise delegated authority? Where do we learn how to sense the will of another and then put, bring it to pass? Well, that's the arena of prayer. As Bellheimer has said, prayer is training for reigning. Revelation 3, 21, the one who overcomes will sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Revelation 5, 10, we are to be a kingdom of priests and we shall reign on the earth. 24 talks about those who were beheaded who had not received the mark of the beast. They shall reign with him a thousand years. Uh, 22, 5, they will reign forever and ever. And this also goes along with Daniel 7, 22 through 27, and especially verses 13 through 18, where we see the saints of the Most High uh, being given rulership, reigning along with this uh, Ancient of Days who comes and shares His kingdom and His dominion with His people. This also tells us the purpose of trials. Why must we go through trials? It is preparation for reigning and ruling with Christ. The promises in the book of Revelation are prefaced with this phrase, to him who overcomes. And that's why I've tried to stress that the main theme of this book is the triumph of the Lamb and His people triumph with Him. 
We go through trials now so that we'll be able and, and ready to reign and rule with Him then. And so it is not just arbitrary. There is a purpose for our trials. It is to prepare us through the power of prayer and through the growing of righteousness in our lives by spirit and word to be ready for this great day when all of heaven will burst out saying, Alleluia, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. So we go through trials so that we can overcome, so that we can learn faith, so that we can be purified, so that we can be ready for this great day, the culmination of all of human history, when Jesus Christ comes again and the marriage supper of the Lamb is initiated and we are arrayed in those white robes of righteousness and afterwards we will reign and rule with Him forever. Can you say today, hallelujah, for my God, the controller of it all, the controller of the whole, he has entered into his reign in my life, in my heart. And I'm yielding to his sanctifying work that I might live a righteous life. And I'm learning to pray and I'm learning to overcome. Don't waste this life. Learn to be an overcomer. Learn to be deep in prayer and powerful and faithful in prayer. And righteous in your living. So that when Jesus comes again, you'll be a part of that bride that has made herself ready. Oh, hallelujah. Give God glory and praise for this day will come.